Welcome everyone to our COVID-19 related town hall. It has been a while since we've done one of these, but it is nice to see you all out there in Cyberland. It was even nicer to see many of you at the League Conference a couple of weeks ago as we are pivoting to the new normal here um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Cameron Dale, the Executive Director of the Utah League of Cities and Towns, and we have a tremendous town hall plan for you today with a focus on the American Rescue Plan and, and what it means for every city and town in the state of Utah. Before I introduce our panelists, I want to just take a moment uh, to remind you of where we are and where we've come from and why ARPA, as, uh, as you'll hear over the next few weeks, uh, matters so much. So as a reminder, we saw many of you over the course of the last years, we helped you work through the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act was really a record amount of federal dollars that was designed to help governments and businesses and residents cope with COVID-19 over the last over the last year plus. Utah was one of the few states in the country where the state of Utah shared the maximum amount of CARES Act dollars with cities, towns, and counties. When I talked to my counterparts in other states, they are envious of the partnership between the state of Utah and local governments. And it's really put Utah in a much stronger position. We are in a better public health space than many of our fellow states, and we're in a better economic position than many of our fellow states. Well, in March, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, which for purposes of local governments, more than doubles the amount of money that we saw from CARES that will be flowing to cities and towns Every city and town in the state of Utah is entitled to receive ARPA dollars, but how you receive those dollars will vary depending on your size, and we'll talk about those details today. I want to thank the state of Utah, and Sophia, you're here on behalf of the state, uh, but I want to thank the state of Utah publicly uh, for that partnership on CARES and for that continued partnership as we work through investing ARPA, because this really is a generational opportunity with the amount of dollars that are flowing to the state of Utah. The, from a just sheer dollars and cents perspective, uh, there will be $460 million coming to cities and towns across the state of Utah, which is more than double what cities and towns received under the CARES Act. But the rules and the timing and the framework of ARPA are different than under CARES, which is why this will be this town hall will be informative and then we'll continue to provide resources to you via Friday facts, class emails, and future town halls. If you have questions during today's town hall for any of the speakers or for league staff, please use the chat room. We will be monitoring that as, as league staff and either the speakers will address your questions as they present or we'll address them at the end or we'll follow up with the experts and get back to you via Friday Facts or our other communication channels. When you put questions in the chat box, please address them to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see the questions and we can be as efficient as possible with those. So with that, I want to introduce the program for today's event. In a moment, I will turn it over to Sophia DeCaro, who is the Executive Director of the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, and GOPB will play a vital role in distributing dollars to most cities and towns, but also due to legislation enacted yesterday with league support, uh, also play a vital role in the potential coordination and uh, opportunities for partnership between the state and local governments with ARPA dollars. Uh, after uh, Sophia's presentation, we'll hear from Wayne Bradshaw, the League Policy Director, who's been the point person on ARPA, and he'll walk through the Treasury guidance that came out last week, all 151 pages. So hopefully you'll be ready to take notes. Uh, I assume, Wayne, you're just doing the summary rather than a word-for-word -word analysis, but you have done that uh, for us, and it's the Treasury guidance is still a working document, so um, stay tuned, more changes still to come. Following Wayne, I'll take a moment, and then we'll hear from Mayor Caldwell, the league president. We'll talk about the process that Ogden City is undertaking to prioritize ARPA dollars, and then we'll finish with uh, Zions Bank economist uh, uh, Robert Spenlove, who also serves in the Utah State Legislature, to talk about some of the unique aspects of having this much money coming into the economy at the same time and one of the major points of emphasis in our discussions with the legislature has been around the potential for inflation and other economic impacts and consequences 
of spending ARPA dollars. So we'll touch on that as well. So with that, Sophia, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will turn the time over to you. Great, thank you, Cameron. Uh, wanna thank you for the invitation uh, to share share some of this today and, and also look forward to coming back in the future as, as more information evolves. Um, uh, this is a great forum and we certainly appreciate what you do and look to you as a, a partner in, in carrying a lot of this out as well. So uh, with that, as, as Cameron had already mentioned, uh, a great deal of money is coming to the state of Utah. Uh, we anticipate $1.378 billion coming directly to the state entity, uh, $623 million going to the counties, uh, $290 million going to uh, metro cities, and then we have non-entitlement units of government that will receive $180 million. Um, so with that, um, we... We know that, um, well, I guess, let me go back a little bit. I, uh, there was confusion initially. A, a lot of people thought we were gonna get one and a half billion dollars of funds. Um, it just should be noted that every state received $500 million, uh, uh, $500 million base. And then on top of that, um, the unemployment figures were taken into consideration, which led to our 1.38 billion. So I wanted to put that out there just because um, there were different numbers floating out earlier. Uh, but now that we have some preliminary guidance, that is what is coming to Utah. Um, and another thing to note is that uh, the timing of that, we will get half of that in May and the other half uh, up to May of 2022. So 12 months later, all local entities um, will receive funds in two equal tranches, one in 2021 and one in 2022 as well. And now we look at how localities will receive funds uh, because we are um, having different groups of uh, cities in town. So the the first category is receiving funds directly from the, the treasury, and that will be the state of Utah, that will be all 29 counties and 16 metro cities. These are cities with a population of more than 50,000 people. So these 16 metro cities will receive direct from the treasury, not through uh, the money that will flow through the governor's office planning and budget. Um, and you, they're all listed there, as you can see. Then we have what is called the non-entitlement units of local government. There's about 238 of those entities. Um, and again, those are population of less than $50,000 now, or excuse me, 50,000 population. So um, we know that we have some um, guidance on those direct distributions, but we are waiting on the distributions for non-entitlement non units of uh, uh, entities in the coming days. So um, we know what the amounts are for the group on the left. We are waiting um, for additional information to come out for um, the group on the right. And what will localities need to know to do to receive these, um, these funds? So again, um, we have final predetermined allocations. Um, the city counties and metro cities will request funds directly from the treasury as stated before. These funds are available now. Uh, any county and any of those 16 metro cities can request those funds today from the treasury's website. And then the non-entitlement entities will need to sign an agreement uh, with the governor's office of planning and budget. Um, and this agreement will be different than the CARES Act uh, agreement uh, that was signed that first tranche of money. Um, this agreement will be available on our website, gopb.utah.gov um, at a later time. And um, through our website, we'll provide instructions for receiving funds and uh, Taylor Kaufman from our office will also send an email out uh, to, to all of the uh, applicable entities. Um, in addition, the Utah League of Cities and Towns will distribute information in email as well, and we'll plan on doing a follow-up training and uh, an overview of, of, of how that will work. So as part of this agreement that we plan to put in place, um, cities and towns will need to submit a PDF copy of their 
uh, most recent budget as of January 27th of 2020. GOPB will uh, receive a signed copy of the agreement. Um, GOPB will verify the information and GOPB will work with the treasurer's office to transfer those funds to non-entitlement entities. Um, now, it is important that uh, what does get submitted is uh, the same information that, that you uh, end up putting on um, the state auditor's office when you submit your budget so that we have some consistency on the information that we'll check against. Um, and we'll have more on that again as uh, information comes out. So um, with that, we'll go to the next slide. And um, it's important to know that non-entitlement entities can't receive more than 75% of their most recent budget. So again, we'll, we'll verify this information. Um, we'll ask for some information with the application and we'll verify that before we provide funds. Um, budget is defined as the total operating budget uh, as of January 27th, 2020. And it'll likely be your adopted fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, if a non-entitlement entity didn't have a formal budget as of January 27th of 2020, an entity can self-certify its most recent annual expenditures as of uh, 20, uh, Jan January 27th of 2020. Um, but again, we'll want to make sure that information is consistent with whatever you provide the state auditor's office. Um, funds uh, over the 75% funding cap will be sent back to the treasury. Uh, and so it's important that we try to get that number um, right up front so that you don't end up in that situation. Okay, my slides are, are transitioning in the wrong order, so I apologize for that. Um, so going on now to um, what Cameron mentioned before, it happened during a special session, uh, HB 1004 uh, created a local assistant, uh, local assistance matching grant program. And it provides $50 million to our office to match for uh, four categories of spending, and that's affordable housing for, or um, homelessness, uh, public health challenges, water and sewer infrastructure, and then some allow other allowable uses under ARP. We will be working closely with the Utah League of Cities and Towns, as well as um, the Utah Association of Counties to uh, formulate what that process looks like over time. So again, uh, you know, earlier in the slides, I mentioned the counties um, and larger cities will be able to get direct now. Um, I would recommend waiting to see how this rolls out. Uh, because you might be able to leverage some of the things you want to accomplish with this local match program. And um, there's a possibility that this could grow in the future as well. Um, okay, now we do anticipate just in terms of timing that we'll have uh, some of the processes and procedures outlined before September of uh, 2021. So again, stay tuned for that. Um, how we thought it would be really uh, great guidance for everyone to know how the governor uh, intends to, to uh, you know, um, uh, prioritize spending. And uh, it's really, these are the uh, guiding principles that Governor Cox um, has communicated out there. And that's to be fiscally prudent and, you know, make sure we're not creating any uh, structural budgetary issues in the future. Uh, make sure that the investments are proactive and that, um, we're solving existing challenges, but looking at doing it in, in um, innovating ways and uh, positioning the state to better prepare for future, uh, future challenges like pandemics and such. Um, we want to make sure that the spending is targeted and focused on the people, industry, and locations that continue to suffer the greatest impact. Uh, we want to make sure it's enduring and that, that in, we, we favor investments that solve an existing problem. Um, but also provide an enduring benefit. And we also want to make sure that we're accountable. So uh, we are trying to coordinate with the state auditor's office and figure out the best way to make sure uh, that we are accountable uh, to the taxpayers um, and, and more to come on that. Um, but it's also, uh, 
important to think about uh, projects that you know won't create inflationary pressures and um, and think about um, think about uh, situations where um, we could be thoughtful in that respect. And again, we do intend to uh, deploy this local grant matching program. Uh, and we'll look for ways uh, for all the local entities to collaborate, to coordinate, uh, and figure out how we can solve some cross-jurisdictional issues as well that will benefit the state overall. Um, so with that, Cameron, I'll just pause right there and open it up for any questions. Perfect. Thank you, Sophia. We're monitoring the chat room to see if there are any questions that come up uh, while we're one question that has come up here is about the timing of the operating budget. Uh, if the operating budget is based on January 2020 or January 2021. So maybe that's something, Sophia, that Wayne, you could just reference in your comments or we can just follow up. Uh, that was... Wayne, do you know the answer to that one off the top of your head or Sophia? Well, I had 2020 um, and, but you know, we will, we will do a follow-up again as we get this, as we get um, additional information and formal guidance that comes out, we will come back and, um, and, and make sure, you know, we do an overview of the application process and, and, and clarify uh, what we think uh, will be the best approach for the budget side. Perfect. A couple of questions about your slide deck, Sophia, and, and uh, we'll share that with the other resources that will come from this town hall on in Friday Facts tomorrow. Uh, there's a question from Dixon in Provo. Well, I guess the previous question is about being able to review on the Treasury site. And yes, some of this information is on the Treasury site, and some of it is in our the FAQ document that we have been putting together and posting on our website. A uh, question from Provo about the local assistance match uh, for the state ARP allocation. Uh, and the question is, what does the local match need to consist of? Is that local ARP dollars or can it be bigger than local ARP dollars? So appreciate the question. Um, those are the types of details that will be worked out over the coming weeks. Um, the, the, the bill just passed yesterday and we're gonna be forming a, a a, a, a meeting with the related stakeholders that will um, decide that path forward. So just stay tuned for, for those details on the local match program and we'll, we'll plan to come back to this forum and, and report back. Perfect, and Sophia, I wanna thank you and your team uh, on the matching piece. Let me, I, I should have mentioned this before, but I've known Sophia a long time. When she was a legislator, she was extremely responsive to local government needs and, and the league. And so I'm thrilled that you're in this position uh, with the governor's office. But to put in context what Sophia just presented about Utah's approach, uh, I talked to my counterparts in other leagues just last Friday, and I was blown away at the number of league directors who said, that their states didn't have a plan for how they were going to spend ARP dollars. They didn't know who in the state government was going to administer the local dollars. Uh, there was no co cooperation of any sort between state and locals, and it was just a dumpster fire. Meanwhile, here in the state of Utah, we have principles in place. We have a matching fund program that's already been enacted, and now we're going to be working through the details. And, and Wayne and I have been involved in the negotiations as we've been working on, on that. We have a process in place at the state level. Local governments are already working through their processes. So the collaboration yeah, is, is really on full display here for this generational opportunity of investment. So Sophia, thanks to you and, and your team for the part that, that you're playing there. Well, thank you, Cameron. And we look forward to working with you on, on formalizing that. Are there any other questions for Sophia and her team? And if so, throw them in the Q&A. Justin, I saw your question about the what the local match amount will be and similar to the answer with Dix, and that's all to be determined in the next few weeks as we put the meat on the bones for the matching program. Well, Sophia, it looks like you have 
answered everyone's questions and oh, oh, here comes a question. I was just about to let you go. <laughs> so this question uh, about resort communities uh, trying to address congestion or capacity levels for transit and sewer, can local assistance funds be matched with ARP funds? Yeah, so th that those are some of the details that will be worked out, but that is the idea. Um, is that you know these local entities will have ARP money going direct? How can we help influence some of the uh, you know these issues that have cross jurisdictional boundaries um, and and help solve some of these bigger problems uh, by providing a match? And uh, so hopefully that answers the question. Now in terms of the specifics, those details will be worked out in the coming months. Another Provo question. Uh, do the school districts get any of those matching funds? So they, it, it's, it's, it's possible they could. Those matching funds, though, are provided for those four categories that we uh, talked about earlier. Um, and that was primarily the housing issue. Um, it was primarily uh, water, sewer, um, and some health issues, and, and then some uh, ancillary issues. So uh, is it possible? It's possible. Uh, but again, you know, we have to work out the details on how much of that will be allocated for certain things. And um, those details, again, will be worked out in the coming months. Perfect. And when Wayne talks through the Treasury Department guidance, he'll talk, Cliff, about what U.S. cities can do to share your funds with other entities, which gets to the second half of your question. Any other questions uh, for Sophia? While I wait for the final pause here, I'll also note the legislature has allocated some of their ARP money for other specific projects. So there's a set aside for housing that we'll talk about later. There's a set aside for water infrastructure that could also be used potentially for matching, uh, matching funds for secondary water metering. Uh, so even if it's not in that $50 million bucket that Sophia um, described, there are other state ARPA funds out there. Uh, in fact, I shouldn't use the word other. I should say there's significant uh, state ARPA funds out there uh, that we are trying to maximize and, and leverage together. So um, Wayne will have a little more detail on that. But for now, Sophia, it looks like we've gone once, gone twice. And oh, look at that. One question just in time but the tranche funds distributed need to fall into one of the four categories. So the, the ca four categories I mentioned relate to the local match program. And yes, that is in statute. Um, to Cliff's second question, the, the, there, there is money going direct to the schools outside of uh, what we're talking about. And I'm sure Wayne will talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so schools will be getting some direct um in and out, outside of what the municipalities are getting um and uh there there's other allowable expenditures in the general pots that are going direct to the municipalities that won't be um just limited to those four categories those four categories were just limited to the local match program hopefully that helps perfect well, Sophia, thank you very much for joining us and uh, thank you to your team for their work with us on the CARES Act a year ago and now going forward on ARPA. So thank you for your partnership and for your collaboration. Great, thank you, Cameron. I'll hang out for a bit. Perfect. Well, Wayne, I think this is a perfect segue to talk about the Treasury Department guidance because a lot of these questions fit within uh, what Treasury told us last week. So. Uh, Let's see how fast you can talk through 151 pages of guidance. Thanks, <laughs> Cam. Um, so I want to start my presentation off. I included the link in the chat box to all panelists and attendees, so you can you can have access to this as well. But this is the landing page for a lot of the guidance and information that the Treasury is putting out regarding the American Rescue Plan and how local governments can use those plans. So if you notice on the um, right hand side. There's some kind of uh, buttons. If you are a large municipality, so 50,000 or more, this is where you come to access your funds for the American Rescue Plan. I do recommend that at least one person in every city and town 
signs up for the updates from Treasury. So the new guidance, new updates to the FAQs comes out, your city will get that. Okay. Um, let me see if I can, I'll try and talk a little louder and let me know if that, that comes in better. On the right, you'll also see quick links to various um, uh, data points or information, and you'll want to look at that as well. As you scroll down, um, there's again, more information that we'll, uh, we'll be covering. I'll also include in the link, we have linked to um, on our website, the uh, 150 pages of guidance that the treasury put out that I will now cover in my, my presentation. But uh, this has page numbers on it. I will be referring to page numbers in your, um, okay. Cam, do you mind just taking over for a second and I will call in and talk to this over my phone? Sounds like my audio is having a problem. Yep, no problem. So while Wayne uh, switches to plan B on the audio, uh, let me give you just some context about the 151 pages of guidance. It is still a working document. So for the next few weeks, they are taking public comment, they being the Treasury Department. The League partnered with the National League of Cities to submit multiple questions over the last few weeks, trying to seek clarity. And then we anticipate that the final rule will build off of uh, the questions that are coming in related to the guidance that came out last week. The entitlement cities have received their direct allocation. Those are the 16 CDBG cities of over 50,000 in population. The other cities will be receiving their allocations shortly uh, via the state of Utah as Sophia described. Over the next few weeks, as the Treasury Department finalizes their guidance, one word of caution that we have uh, based on the feedback we've received from Treasury is that recognize that it, like the CARES Act, it still is a bit of a moving target and the dollars don't need to be, um, the dollars don't need to be allocated right away. Uh, you have until 2024 to earmark the dollars and until 2026 to spend the dollars. Half of the money is coming in one tranche this year and the other half is scheduled to come next year. So keep that timing in mind as you are making your plans of how to spend ARPA dollars that it's coming in the two different tranches 12 months apart. And unlike the CARES Act, which had that fixed date of December 30th, where you had to spend the money, you have several years uh, to spend the or to actually plan to spend the dollars and then until 2026 to actually spend the dollars. Uh, Wayne, have you been able to call in? Yes, I am back. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you and I'm going to okay. assume that Bart can hear you. Uh, so Bart, let us know. And if, if not, then uh, if necessary, Wayne, you can use my phone. Uh, we're down the hall after all, so fire away. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what I've got on the screen now is you're going to see in a lot of the Treasury guidance, they are they pull definitions and information from other federal sources, and they really try and hit home. There's an importance regarding why you choose to spend your ARP dollars and where you choose to spend that and the record keeping that you have uh, going forward. And so this is a, just something that we put together at the league. Uh, this is something we have presented to the, to the legislature saying we are going to um, encourage our membership to really try and target their ARP spending. So that means leverage it. So look at those state grant programs that are available, other federal programs, and also partner with your surrounding communities and counties when you, and, and make sure you're using your, your ARP dollars to the, to the uh, best extent. Good governance. Um, make sure that you have a good planning process in place. Make sure you have a good record keeping process in place because you will be reporting on these dollars until 2026. And so elections will come, staff will come and go. And so you need to make sure you have something in place that can, can move through those changes and you can re respond to the treasury when they ask questions and, and meet the demands of, of the law. And then of course, finally invest in recovery and, and results for your community. Um, just in the corner there, I pulled just a snapshot of a story that came out in April from Forbes.com. Uh, they asked the question, why is the state of Utah getting ARP dollars? Because we have had a strong economy for the most part and, and, and we're rebounding very quickly. 
Um, and as many of you know, during CARES, there have been local stories about how some uh, entities use their CARES funding, and there is going to be scrutiny on how you use your American Rescue Plan dollars. So if, I, if the only thing you take away from this is please think about what you're doing with these dollars and plan accordingly and keep track of how you spend them. So these are the overarching on how you can spend your, your treasury or your American Rescue Plan dollars. You can spend it on public health, economic hardship, essential workers, you can uh, public sector revenue, and then water, sewer, broadband, and infrastructure. So public health. In the treasury guidance, so that I've linked on our website, if you plan on spending it on public health, they recommend you review pages 10 through 23. Treasury puts a test or a requirement for you using your, your dollars for public health. You need to identify the negative impact that COVID-19 has had on your community. And then you have to identify how spending that will intervene or address those negative impacts um, with the ARP dollars. The overall uh, kind of arching policy that they outline is you can do mitigation and prevention. So ventilation improvements, um, marketing for uh, getting your vaccine, so those kind of expenses. Medical expenses, behavioral health care, public health and public safety. Under CARES, there was a presumption that you could cover your public safety budgets with CARES funds and, and that, would be, that would meet the demands of the law. Treasury and their guidance regarding American Rescue Plan has some additional qualifiers that I think you should, you should review before deciding to spend your dollars on public safety. They do require that you do a periodic review that, and determine that if those dollars and those staffers are working on COVID-19 related issues. Under this section, you can also um, assist uh, disparities in public health outcomes. So Treasury identifies the qualified census tract as you can just assume that those individuals in a qualified census tract have disparities in public health outcomes and you can use your ARPA dollars to overcome or assist with those, those impacts. Um, and then these are a list of those, those options that, are, that Treasury spells out. Treasury does say that you, if you don't have qualified census tract um, in your community, that you can uh, still spend the dollars on these allowable uses, but you need to identify and justify why those uh, residents in your community de uh, are deserving of uh, these resources. Economic hardships. I would review pages 23 through 43 in the Treasury guidance if you're going to spend it on economic hardship. On page 30 through 31, again, there's another test that uh, Treasury is telling you that you need to determine before you spend your funds. So you have to identify the uh, economic harm or impacts that COVID-19 caused and then define how these funds are going to reduce those impacts. They also clarified that the response must be proportional to the impact. You can, uh, the allowable uses are assistance to unemployed workers, assistance to household. So if any of you did grants under CARES funding for um, utilities or rent or, um, you know, just everyday expenses, again, this would be allowable. You can also provide funds to small business and not, and not for profits. You can use these funds if you laid off any staff because of the impacts to your budgets uh, related to COVID-19. You can use these funds to rehire these staff um, and whatever expenses are associated with that. You can also provide funding to impacted industries. The Treasury identifies tourism, travel, and hospitality, but if there are industries in your community that uh, are directly impacted from uh, COVID-19, you can identify those. Again, you'll need data to do that. And then you can provide assistance to them, whether that's in uh, grants, whether that's in providing it funds to, uh, you know, change uh, structures and rebuild those structures so they can welcome folks back into the community and also um, prevent the spread of COVID-19. 
Uh, one port, part of it's important is that you must meet, maintain records about how those entities spent the funds. So if you're granting money to a local business that is a tourism business, you need to maintain records about how they spent those funds and that information must be publicly reported. And finally, you can uh, again, provide additional assistance to those within the qualified census tract within your community. So there's a question about paying for hiring positions that were previously frozen. So I would say yes, if you can identify that those positions were frozen as a result to, from COVID-19. Essential workers. Uh, you can cover premium pay for essential workers. I would review pages 45 through 51. Uh, so they define essential workers as somebody that was in person working or had to uh, physically handle items that another uh, person handled. So if you had individuals that were working from home, they would not qualify for hazard pay or premium pay as it's defined in the, in the um, treasury guidance. You can also grant funds to businesses in your community to provide premium pay that have essential workers. So you can use it for your essential workers and you can also grant it to businesses in your community. You can come say that up to $13 an hour uh, and not exceed $25,000 for an employee. You'll need to document this and it will also um, need to be publicly available where these funds went. Uh, you cannot reduce pay. So if an employee is making $10 an hour and you want to give them the premium pay of $13 an hour, uh, they, you still need to maintain their $10 that you're providing. Um, this is the, one of the few aspects that you can look backwards. So Treasury is saying generally the funds need to look from March 2021 moving forward. Uh, premium pay is one of those things that you can look back to throughout the pandemic and offer them premium pay um, and not just since March 2021. Revenue loss. So this is allowed to, if you experience revenue loss from the start of the pandemic, you can go back in and you can use American Rescue Plan dollars to cover those losses. Uh, Treasury uses the definition of general revenue from the census. And so this is, includes your tax revenues, the fees that you might be charging and intergovernmental transfers like the BNC road funds that you get from the state of Utah. However, this does exclude the funds that are generated by utilities. And so we, uh, while the guidance is in effect today, Treasury is taking comments and we um, um, with NLC have submitted comments saying that utility should be included as part of your revenue loss. But as of today, it does not allow for that to happen. Treasury says that they, you can, there are four different time periods in which you can look back and look at the revenue loss within your community. They have a formula that's on page 58. And so one of the way that you look at your revenue loss is you look at the previous three fiscal years before the pandemic and look at your average growth in revenue, or you can use the, the national standard of 4.1%, whichever is greater, and then you move forward and look at your revenues. And if they did not grow by that either three year fiscal year or the 4.1%, then you can determine that as revenue loss. I would recommend that you take a look at this formula because when you move ARP funds into your general fund, it has the same flexibility as general funds do have in your, um, as they do now. And so, uh, but again, record keeping will be important and treasury will want to know where those dollars ultimately ended up that you put into your general fund um, because of revenue loss. Um, so there's a question about aggregating general revenues um, on an entity basis. So, so what Treasury wants you to do is look at your overall budget. They don't want you to break it down by divisions or, or departments within your city. They want one large aggregate number. Um, but again, you'll need to exclude utilities um, until, unless Treasury changes that guidance. What about recovering revenue from sales tax? 
So, uh, like I said, you may you may have um, seen a growth in your sales tax during this fiscal year. What Treasury is telling you is that if that growth is not greater than the growth in the average year three previous fiscal years before COVID-19 or 4.1%, you can determine revenue loss um, based on those two numbers and, the, and the, the rest of the formula. Does Grant Revenue CARES Act count as revenue? That's a great question. Um, and that's something that, that we can follow up with Treasury. I, I would anticipate no, because it is not one of your um, tax revenues or other types of general revenues that, that you're, you're producing as a city. And finally, a question about, is premium pay limited to the total of $13 an hour for regular pay, or does the $13 relate to the bonus itself? So $13 is how much you can, it's, a, it's the bonus. You can go up to $13 an hour, but their overall compensation can exceed $25,000. So although there's not a provision for transportation, we have, we have understood that transportation can fit under this revenue loss provision. Correct. That, uh, so when you're calculating your revenue loss, you can include intergovernmental transfers like the funds that you receive from the state of Utah, the BNC road funds. So, so you can include that when you're looking at your revenue loss. And then once you determine revenue, revenue loss, you can put it in your general fund and treat it like other general fund dollars that has, again, more flexibility than the, the main arching provisions within uh, the ARP dollars. Water and sewer. I review pages 62 through 69. So Treasury, what Treasury does is they pull standards from EPA under the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund and said, you know, if you're looking at a water or sewer project, these are the, this is the standard you should use to determine if, if it's an appropriate use for water and sewer. You do not have to be on the state list regarding these two accounts, these grant programs, but you do need to meet the same standards that, uh, that these two uh, revolving um, funds require when it comes to funding for, you know, the water, sewer, stormwater uh, infrastructure. Uh, we will be working with uh, DEQ to see if they can come on and give presentations about these two standards. And I will link their websites in the chat box later on um, in the presentation. But again, if you're looking at water and sewer, these are your standards to determine if uh, ARP funds will qualify. Uh, you can also use uh, these funds to address impacts of climate change, prevent water source pollution, um, do cybersecurity upgrades for your, for your systems to make sure that they, they aren't uh, succumb to uh, hacking. Broadband is pages 62 um, and then 69 through 78. There are speed requirements. So if you're going to do a broadband project, there are speed requirements that you must meet with these dollars. So you need 100 MPBS download or 20 and 20 MPBS upload. You can overcome these requirements, uh, but you will need to, to identify and, and keep records of why the expense cost, the geography, or the topography prevented you from providing those speeds. You should also focus on unserved and underserved communities um, when looking at spending these dollars. Restrictions on using these. Um, that's pages 78 through 81 and 96 through 97. Here's just kind of a list that you cannot put that you can't use these funds to put in your rainy day account. You can't pay for debt or debt settlements. You can't use these for matching grants. So if you're going after federal funds that require a, a matching portion, you cannot use ARP funds for a matching grant. There are recommendations um, on page 62 about your water, sewer, and infrastructure projects about having labor agreements, uh, prevailing wages, and and also states there will be additional reporting requirements regarding these labor standards, labor agreements, and prevailing wages. It doesn't mandate them, 
But I do think it's important as you look at these projects to document why uh, you did not adopt the labor standards, labor agreements, or prevailing wages. Finally, it's just some need to know information. Like I said, uh, this is prospective. This is about using funds from March 3rd, 2021 forward. There are the few exceptions, which is premium pay and revenue loss, but you should not look at reimbursing yourself for a water sewer project that you've completed already. This is looking forward to that new infrastructure. Now the funds must be obligated by 2024 but you do not have to fully spend them until 2026. And that's an important clarification in Treasury guidance. So you do have a longer window to plan and prepare and spend these dollars. There are reporting requirements. The larger cities, so 50,000 and larger, they have to have a report submitted to Treasury by August 31st of 2021, and then there will be a quarterly reports. There is an additional reporting requirement for metropolitan cities with residents of over 250,000. Everyone else, so if you get your funds from the state, you are required to submit a report to Treasury once a year. Your first report will be due October 31st that covers your spending until the end of September. So again, you will, re you will be submitting an annual report through 2026 to Treasury on your American Rescue Plan dollars. So that was kind of just the overarching treasury guidance. As more information comes available, we will cover that and hold additional uh, town halls and, and send out additional information. You do need to know that this is an interim rule. So it has the effect of law today, but treasury can make changes um, after the 60 day comment period and amend that rule moving forward. So there is, this is going to be rolling guidance um, Treasury expressed interest in not doing that, but again, because of the complexity and the amount of money and the time frame, there will be rolling guidance, so make sure and, and be prepared for that. Sophia did cover uh, the matching grants, and so... Uh, Wayne, there are a few questions in the, in the chat room, though, or in the okay. chat box, uh, clarifying questions about the restriction on matching funds versus the matching program that we have in the state. Okay. Uh, let me scroll back up here. There's a question, if we use ARP funding on water sewer funds, water sewer, do we need to transfer and follow all the state auditor guidelines on transfers, CARES funds we put in the general fund? Yes, I, m my recommendation would be yes, that you need to treat these funds like, like your general fund and, and treat them and document how you use them accordingly. Uh, has there been any discussions with Treasury about using revenue shortfall payments for debt service payments possibly being relaxed? We have some debt being serviced by uh, transient room taxes, uh, so we do not like to see if there if we could use utilize it for funding. So that that guidance could potentially change, but Treasury expressed in their guidance document multiple times that these funds are for recovery, and so debts incurred. Uh, for other government services or throughout the, the you know, process um, as your city management, they, they don't want you using it for that. And so I don't anticipate that changing, but as of right now, no, you would not be able to cover uh, existing debt. Can, you, can, you, uh, can municipalities use their ARP funds to match the state's ARP local assistance matching grant? The answer is yes. So, um, the state has decided to set aside funding and over the $50 million, and then I'll cover the $35 million. But yes, you can use your ARP funds to match the state's ARP funds. You just cannot use your ARP funds to match, say, a FEMA grant um, or other federal agency grant uh, requirements. Okay, uh, yeah, so there was a couple of questions and I apologize about the confusion. So if you are going to a federal agency for funding and it requires a matching grant, you cannot use your ARP funds. For the $50 or $50 million matching program, program 
you're going to the state for those funds and that um, that same requirement does not apply. So we are expecting and anticipating that you will use your ARP funds to match the state grant requirement. Interest rates dropped, PTIF uh, interest revenue dropped as a result. How do we account for these this revenue loss? Uh, that is a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but again, I would refer you to um, the the pages 51 through 61, um, and then on page 58, there's there's a step by step formula uh, that you'll you'll want to use in in determining your revenue loss. When can we get to specific um, equitability? Would funding for aquifer studies be eligible for funding? So we'll have to address kind of whether some a project would fall under water and sewer requirements um, when we bring in DEQ to talk about the re, uh, revol revolving fund requirements the EPA has set out. So if it would qualify under EPA standards uh, for these projects, then you could use your ARP funds, but we'll we'll bring them on at a later town hall to discuss more specifics. Um, going to go through the last few slides very quickly so we can get to the other parts of the program. But uh, so Sophia covered the $50 million matching grant program. The state also set aside $35 million that's going to go Utah or go ed as it previously was called for, for cities and towns if they are going to change the zoning of their industrial commercial to residential or mixed residential with a minimum of eight units to the acre. So if you have an application in hand to up to change the zoning um, to residential or mixed residential with certain density, you can go to GOED and apply to up to $2.5 million in state uh, ARP funds to go towards housing in your community. So again, this is, a, this is another way that the state is providing access to their ARP funds that you can bring to your community um, for the requirements, like I said, for the change in zoning. So as more information, those again, those were passed yesterday in the special session. As we get more information, we will hold additional town halls with GOMB and GOED to roll out the details of those two grant programs. I'm gonna give a pitch here for the USU Wellness Survey. This is um, something that Courtney, Dr. Flint does at USU. She does it, she provides it for free for cities and towns. And she, and all you have to do is be a partner in helping distribute the survey to the residents in your community. And she collects a plethora of information. It's largely targeted at, at trying to identify the important aspects of your community. And as you're planning for growth, how to protect those, those aspects. But in this last round, she did ask questions about the well-being of your residents for, and, and the impact COVID-19 had on, on those residents. This, this is important data that you can use in identifying the, the actions that you're going to take with your AARP funds. And this will help justify those actions um, because you collected that from your residents and you can identify specific um, pinch points within your community. I put her contact information here. She does these surveys once a year. Um, she does them generally in the, um, in the fall. And so if you would like to participate, I encourage you to reach out to her. And um, again, it's very helpful and useful information. And I will link her website here shortly. Here's my contact information. I will also link, and we uh, will link it on our website if you have questions, we are trying to collect them in um, kind of a systematic format so we can make sure that we address them as well as uh, get, get responses out. So I'll link that in the uh, chat box as well. And uh, there's one, okay. And then I will throw it over to Cam. Perfect, thank you, Wayne. Thank you for your tremendous work. Uh, between Wayne and, and me, we are on calls at the National League of Cities about ARPA almost every day, uh, gathering information that we can then in turn share with you. The League Board of Directors in April uh, considered and in May approved actually um, the creation of a, of a temporary League employee to help our municipalities on the technical assistance side. Uh, as Wayne and Sophia have presented, there are a lot of moving parts on ARPA. 
and we will have communities across the state. All, we already are receiving uh, countless questions across the state. And as you start receiving the dollars and you have the reporting requirements uh, and you're trying to align things with uh, state matches, uh, the league board approved this temporary employee and uh, the request of our cities and towns is a small flat fee based on your ARPA assessment in order to provide this service. An additional piece to emphasize is the need to tell the story of how you're spending these dollars. We've already seen headlines in recent weeks questioning what governments are doing with both CARES Act dollars and ARPA dollars, and we want to make sure we have the information in hand to tell the stories of the generational investments that cities and towns are making. Uh, we're finalizing the details, but wanted to give you that overview that the League Board approved this position just this past Monday. Um, it'll be independent of our ongoing revenue with dues and would be a voluntary um, assessment based on your ARPA allocations. So stay tuned for the final details after we coordinate them with the City Management Association. With that, I want to introduce the League President, Mayor Caldwell, to talk about the process that Ogden City is using around ARPA, and then we'll finish up with, uh, with Representative Robert Spenlove from Zions Bank. So Mayor Caldwell, take it away. Thanks, Cam. Am I on? Okay. Hey, I want to echo a couple things that have been said uh, earlier about uh, gratitude for the state leadership in this crazy cycle. It was there for the CARES money. It gave us a foundation to work from in terms of how our city is approaching this. But what the state and what the governor's office of, of budget and, and planning has done, and Cam, what you and your team have done, have been amazing. I'm lucky in that I'm one of the larger cities along the Wasatch Front and we have resources to drill into some of these issues and to look at that and to do the reporting and everything else. A lot of the smaller communities have reached out and said, we just don't have the bandwidth and the expertise in-house to do any of this important work. And uh, we're, we're nervous about where to go with it. And so what you've all done as league staff and what the governor's office has done and, and our state leadership, I think has been phenomenal. Um, I know that Wayne had a lot of information to give. I was scheduled to give 10 minutes. I'll yield a bunch of my time over to him, but we have four key things that we're doing as a city as we plan for this looking forward. One of the priorities we have is collaboration between governments. I agree with uh, Governor Cox when he said that our children are gonna be paying for the investments we're making in the next couple of years for this and how we leverage that to, to make our communities more connected, I think is really important. So we have, um, uh, we've been having meetings with our county commissioners and with our COG up here to make sure we understand what some of the issues are and some of the priorities need to be in Weber County for how we, we look at these, these investments and this money. So I think collaboration between other cities and, and the local government is really critical to that. It's a priority for us. We also have prioritized long-term economic benefit for this. We wanna see these to these, these resources and investments made in a way that are, are evergreening in the future and continue to help drive our economy. Um, we're gonna have to pay for this down the line at some point, all of us through our taxes and, and everything else. We wanna make sure that we're raising the tide that will lift all the boats in the harbor for uh, economic prosperity and priority down the line. That's a, a really important thing. And then we wanna leverage what we personally have with other grants, et cetera. I appreciated Wayne's detailed information on that. And we do recognize that right now, this is a moving target. And so I would encourage everybody to, as we say often measure twice and then cut once as we look at um, how to invest this money because it, it is changing, it's evolving. And I think we're gonna get smarter. One of the conversations I've had with, uh, you know, I think it was with uh, leadership at the legislatures, if everybody runs out and tries to put this into roads or sidewalks or water projects, there aren't enough contractors, there's not enough equipment to really, it would overwhelm our construction industry. So I encourage people to look at timing, talk to their communities, their, um, their, whether it's a county or the city that you're in, everybody's got to be careful with how we look at this and make sure that we invest with the greatest return on investment for the state. If we do it right, and with the state leadership that we have, I think this will be a once in a lifetime benefit to us in, in the state of Utah. If we don't coordinate and work really hard at that coordination effort, I think we'll lose a, a really unique opportunity for ourselves. So we're committed to making sure that we have that dialogue, that we engage with the public. 
Um, during our CARES money, we uh, had 170 different entities that we worked with to get access to some of that CARES money. So we had a really robust public outreach components. So we were able to hear what um, some of the challenges were out there. We, we've uh, collected all of that information and that will be part of our consideration process as we move forward. But I encourage everybody to be very careful and to use the resources of the league and the league staff to help identify what's happening. I know that 151 page treasury guidance thing dumped and Wayne probably spent two days reading it and that was his exclusive assignment. That That's a luxury that, well, I wouldn't say it's a luxury, but uh, that's something that not a lot of people had the ability to do to pile into that. And so we really do appreciate and need you all helping us work through as this is gonna be a moving target for a long time. So. With that, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm also happy to hear from our next presenter as well. Well, thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you for your leadership. Mayor Caldwell, Wayne, and I have met with legislative leadership on a couple of occasions to talk about this level of coordination. And really, Mayor Caldwell, your comments, I think, perfectly set up uh, Robert Spinlove, uh, who's here to talk about some of these big picture things to keep in mind from an economic perspective and from an inflation perspective. So. Uh, he is a state representative from the southeast part of Salt Lake County, but he's here today in his capacity as the Economic and Public Policy Officer and Senior Vice President at Zions Bank, which is a great sponsor of the league. So, uh, Robert, take it away. Thanks so much, Cameron. And I totally agree. Uh, Mayor Caldwell's uh, comments, I think, were, were uh, right on the mark. Um, let me make sure. Can you uh, see that? Great. Um, especially that comment that, you know, we, we need to be careful in how we're uh, uh, using the, these funds and, and some of the impacts that we're seeing. It's, it's been really uh, remarkable. Let me just jump in. Let's see. There we go. Um, so one of the areas, uh, uh, Cameron asked me to, to kind of cover what's going on with inflation and some of the, the indicators that we're seeing right now in the economy. So first off, when you look at uh, gross domestic product, so this is kind of measuring our overall economy. And uh, so if you think back a year ago, we saw uh, unprecedented and unexpected drops in the economy where it uh, you know, contracted by 30%. Uh, but now what we're seeing uh, is the economy and, uh, and gross domestic product is coming back really strong. Uh, we had that initial drop and then uh, kind of the, the spike up, uh, but now uh, our basic uh, economy is coming back really strong too, and it's coming back faster than we anticipated. When you look at Utah, um, where the, uh, our GDP, our state GDP is the third fastest growing in the country. And we're seeing this in a number of different indicators, whether you look at overall GDP, when you look at employment, unemployment, uh, Utah is at the top of the pack in coming back from uh, the recession and really leading the nation. Uh, the only states ahead of us in, uh, in GDP growth is, uh, is South Dakota and Texas. Uh, in uh, employment and unemployment, we're right up there uh, kind of battling it out with, uh, with Idaho. So a lot of different indicators are showing that not only is the economy coming back strong, it's coming back, and this is the important one, stronger than we anticipated. Uh, when you look at uh, the consumer confidence is another one of these indicators. We were, before heading into the pandemic, we had very high consumer confidence. People felt good about the economy and good about economic prospects, but then dropped way down uh, when the pandemic hit. Uh, people kind of stayed away, but you look at that jump just in the last couple months, back up to that level where people feel like the economy is prosperous and doing really well. And this is another really interesting one. So one of the things I love about being an, a, an economist is we all steal from each other. Uh, so I'm, I'm stealing this from the Department of Workforce Services who used this in a, a presentation earlier this week and they stole it from a company called Tip Strategies. Uh, and so this is showing the, the change in uh, MSAs, uh, job growth or job change over the last year. And you see that most of the nation, most of the, uh, MSAs in the country are still way down uh, compared to where they, where they were a year ago. But then look at Utah. Utah, uh, really Utah and Idaho 
are coming back really strong. The, the, the one city that is still uh, down compared to a year ago is Salt Lake City, but uh, we're, we're really leading the nation, not only at the state level, but the local level in this economic recovery. Now, one of the results of this, uh, of this great economy and this uh, great comeback though, is we are starting to see a surge in inflation. So this is the, uh, the consumer price index. Uh, one of the, the main indicators of inflation. Now, to put in perspective, the Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, which really sets uh, monetary policy for the United States and really much of the world, has set their target at 2%. And you can see uh, for much of the last two decades, uh, inflation has been right around that 2% level. Uh, we saw much higher inflation uh, before the Great Recession. And this is one of the, the, the fears, is when you see this very high inflation, it often turns into asset bubbles, uh, or you know that we start seeing this froth happening in different parts of the economy. And when you have these high highs, it can then collapse and it turn into uh, deflation. This, is, this was essentially caused by the collapse in the housing market uh, in 2009. So we want to avoid kind of these uh, boom and bust cycles that also we saw deflation, uh, a small amount of deflation in 2015. This was the result of the, uh, the uh, energy prices dropping. If you remember, oil prices dropping from $100 a barrel down to $26 a barrel uh, in, uh, in 2015. Uh, so what are we seeing now? So last month, or excuse me, for in March, uh, inflation was 2.6%. And then it spiked up even higher than we, we had anticipated, up to 4.2%. Uh, again, much higher than uh, the Fed's preferred level. So if we kind of break it down, because you know, one of the questions is, or uh, and you know, it's easy to say what's happening. It's much harder to say why it's happening. And so you know, we're all kind of trying to figure out why it's happening. But one of the explanations uh, that that people are saying is, well, it's because the the it was so low last year that now we have to anticipate and accept it being high. So we call that a, a base effect. And so uh, if we take in that base effect in, into account, let me show you the next one. So look over on the left. This is looking at what we anticipated or the prior month or what we anticipated and what it actually came in at. So that uh, in, in March, it was 0.06. We were expecting 0.02 came in at 0.08. So much higher uh, than we were anticipating. If you annualize that, you know, we're, we're talking uh, over 9% inflation uh, over, over the year. Um, but then, so then let's take out, this is looking at the, uh, the, the month over month. So it's, it's eliminating that base effect. So on a, you know, kind of on a month to month basis, we're still seeing very high inflation. And then uh, kind of on the right, comparing those two, you see how that month to month inflation really is moving up very quickly. So it may be more than just that base effect. Now, another uh, question that we have is whether this is uh, temporary uh, or what the Fed calls transitory, whether this is the effect. I and mean, you know, if you think about a year ago, what were, you know, uh, we were all hoarding toilet paper. And the re result of hoarding toilet paper is the price of toilet paper surged. And we're seeing that uh, uh, different parts of the economy are kind of restarting with uh, fits, uh, uh, kind of bursts and fits and starts. Uh, and so is that what's happening? And we, you know, we need more time to really be able to understand why some of these things are happening. Uh, but when we break down that CPI, or that inflation. And this is looking specifically at kind of our region. So uh, Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. So kind of the Intermountain West. What does it look like? Uh, and you really see, uh, so over you know much of last year, the real high inflation was in medical care, but that's been coming down. But then on the other side, look at transportation, where transportation plummeted uh, as no one traveled last year, but now it's surging. Um, and then the other one that is kind of uh, bumped up and then remained higher is this food and beverages. And that's driving a lot of that local inflation. It's a, a, about 4% uh, 
uh, in our overall inflation. When we break down that, so what I did was I took that, uh, that food area and broke it down a little bit more so we can see the components of that inflation in, uh, in food prices. What's really interesting, I call this the so delicious effect. Uh, we see a big surge, uh, about 9% annual growth in non-alcoholic beverages. Uh, but look at the alcoholic beverages is actually, uh, the prices are dropping. And again, this is- uh, Robert, can I quote you on that so delicious thing? That's yes, you, you, you may, yeah. <laughs> but, it, and it's really, you know, so, so then you kind of say, well, why? You know, and maybe it's that people are feeling better and they're, you know, they're not drinking themselves into a stupor because things are so bad. Now they're going out and buying a Coke. Uh, but Coca-Cola now has announced that they will be raising their prices. So we're seeing this kind of moving through these different effects. Um, an, another one of the big ones uh, right here, meat, poultry, and fish growing at five and a half percent. So we're, we're seeing uh, the, these impacts going on in a lot of different areas. So then I wanted to look at producer prices. So I just showed you consumer prices. What about producer prices? And this is kind of an, a forward indicator of what inflation will look like, because this is what producers uh, are charging for their, uh, for their products. Once again, we see a big surge, even larger, 6.2% uh, in, the, in the PPI. So that, that, what that's saying is we, will, uh, we expect inflation to actually continue to accelerate uh, going forward. And again, looking at that month to month, the prior month was 1%. Uh, we thought we were going to, oh, sorry, let me, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one. We thought we were going to see 0.03, we saw 0.06. So we, we're seeing kind of these, uh, 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 the numbers are coming in much higher than our expectation of where they would come in. Oh, and th there was one other I want to show you. So then you say, okay, well, <clears throat> let's exclude food and energy because those tend to be volatile parts of the economy. Um, and uh, where does that come in? Even higher than the, uh, the core uh, PPI. So, uh, so we're seeing kind of fundamental uh, inflation growth. But uh, a lot of this is because of these supply chain breakdowns. And you're seeing that uh, in a lot of these commodity prices, lumber prices. So what I did was I said, okay, let's ignore the base effect. I'm not gonna go low to high. I'm gonna go from January of 2020 to today. So kind of looking at from right here to where we are today, lumber prices are up 275, corn prices up 108% and copper prices up 72%. Uh, one interesting one with lumber specifically, that's a great example of the supply chain uh, problems. It's, so what we're seeing is, you know, if you think about Econ 101, it's supply and demand. And right now we've got high demand and demand is outstripping supply. So producers are not keeping up with the demand for their products. Back to the toilet paper, uh, we, you know, they couldn't produce enough toilet paper to meet demand. Now we're seeing that with lumber and corn and copper and uh, uh, several different areas. Another one of those areas, uh, a breakdown in supply chain is uh, microchips. Uh, and essentially what it was, was the automakers misread the economy last year. They, they, saw, they anticipated that consumer demand would tank. And so they canceled their microchip orders. And so then when it turned out that uh, demand was increasing, they resubmitted their orders, but now they're at the back, back of the line. And so they're nine months behind schedule. So what does that do? That drives up the prices of new cars. <clears throat> when the prices of new cars go up, uh, the price of those close substitutes or used cars goes up. The price of used cars is now up 20% uh, in the last year, and it just happened in the last couple months. And then uh, rental cars, uh, rental car uh, companies, again, uh, they, they uh, misassigned their expectations for demand and sold off their, their uh, supply of cars and now they're trying to catch back up again, but it's causing those rental car prices to go up. Again, all because of this shortage of microchips. When we look at oil prices, uh, they are <clears throat> once again surging as our demand increases. Uh, one interesting thing, Utah gas prices 
So before the pandemic, our average gas price was around $3 a gallon. Uh, at the worst part of the pandemic, it was about uh, uh, $2 a gallon. Now we're at uh, the average price in Utah is three thirty-six. Not only is it much higher than that pre-pandemic level, but we're also one of the highest in the country. Another area where we're seeing this is uh, home prices. Um, so look back uh, to you know remember this period of 2006 and seven when we had this huge surge in home prices, uh, it, you know, to unheard of levels. What were those unheard of levels? $260,000. I mean, I would kill for a $260,000 house today. Where are we today? 400, nearly 430,000, much above the US rate or the US level of 280. And then when we look at the growth rate, uh, we just pulled this data. Um, we've now passed our uh, pre-Great uh, Recession level of 17.4. We're now at 18.1% annual price appreciation. The other thing that gets me really nervous about this is look at the slope of this curve. Uh, it's accelerating. So what, what you want to see is you want to see either flat or dropping but positive because we're looking at the change in the price. Uh, but when we see this accelerating rate, not only are we at a new high, but it continues to accelerate, that makes me really nervous that, uh, that and this is one of the main sources of inflation, you know, this is taking away disposable income uh, from households, and I am getting nervous. That you know, it kind of reminds me of uh, of, of Alan Greenspan when he started to talk about froth. We're seeing this froth in the economy in a lot of different areas. The big question, of course, is whether it will be uh, temporary, whether it's just part of restarting the economy. Once we get supply matching up with demand. Uh, that it will start to uh, uh, take care of itself. But it is something, if you, if you uh, were paying attention to the stock market uh, in the last few days, the entire reason the stock market has been coming down is because of this concern uh, about inflation and the unexpected inflation. And just yesterday, one of the big reasons the stock market dropped about 500 points midday. And the reason for that is now the Fed is starting to say, that they are concerned, or members of the Fed, I should say, not the Fed altogether, but members of the Fed are saying that they are concerned about this inflationary pressure, and they may have to start cutting back their bond buying and raising price uh, uh, interest rates sooner than we anticipated. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm open to any questions as well. Perfect. Thank you, Robert, for that presentation. The good news, bad news, right? Good news that Utah's in new primed economic position. Bad news that we see these storm clouds on the horizon. Um, I guess my final question for you as we wrap up here is as cities are receiving a huge amount of money from the federal government, uh, Mayor Caldwell referenced the concern about everybody going out right now and building a road when we already can't get concrete. Uh, what are your, what's your 30 second word of caution about how to plan to spend these ARPA dollars if you're looking at infrastructure? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think we need to be very, very cautious about uh, how we use this money. Uh, so, you know, this is the third round of funding we've received from the feds. Uh, the, the, the CARES Act was essentially just, uh, you know, taking care of a catastrophic situation. Um, the, the second round uh, in, in December was, uh, we were still in a really tough economic spot there, but now we're in a different position. We're in a thriving economy and we need to be really careful. You know, you don't want this money to be like throwing gas on a bonfire. You don't want uh, this to cause the economy to overheat. Uh, we're already seeing it overheating in some places. So we need to be really careful, especially about infrastructure uh, spending, not spend it too quick. Uh, not, you know, uh, let, let's wait. We've got several years uh, to be able to spend this. We need to be really careful about how we spend it working together and making sure we're not uh, setting off other uh, inflationary pressures or, or problems with the economy. Terrific. I think that's a perfect way to wrap things up. So for those online, we'll gather up all the presentations and share them in Friday Facts and on the League website. Really, the key takeaways is we'll have more town halls and more resources for you as more information becomes available from both the Treasury Department as well as here in the state. We'll have more details to come about 
um, partnering with you with those ARPA dollars for a temporary league employee to provide technical assistance and other resources to you. And then recognize that Utah is the envy of the country and we need to continue to build on that foundation and invest these dollars in a generational way. So with that, thank you to our panelists, Mayor Caldwell, thanks to you, Sophia and Robert, thanks to both of you. Uh, and we look forward to seeing all of you on a town hall again soon. Thanks everyone. We'll see you at uh, the Legislative Policy Committee on Monday at noon. Wayne, thanks to you too. <laughs> Bye everybody. <laughs>